record this. By the way, um, welcome again, and let's just open in a word of prayer. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for your love and grace. We thank you for all the precious people that are here. We pray a very special blessing on each one, Lord. You know where they're at. You know the questions they have. You know their struggles. And Lord, you know how to meet each and every one of them, whether it's physical or whether it's spiritual or any other way, Lord. And we need you to come down and just minister to us, part the word to us the way you want us to understand it. And we just thank you that you are God. And we just uh, praise you for this and this time together and for this preciousness uh, that uh, these people bring to our lives. And we just say this in your name. Amen. The uh, message tonight is sort of called Having a Right Attitude. Attitude's everything, as you know. You got a rotten attitude. How does that work for you? It doesn't work too well. It makes your day go bad. And it doesn't make people around you too happy. I always tell people, uh, I'm in a bad attitude, so stay away from me, and tomorrow morning I'll feel different about life. And I usually do. But it's something you have to work through. But last week, um, we talked about how God, Elohim is God, creator, and Elohim is used in Genesis 1-1 as creator, and that Elohim is plural. We're talking about within uh, the character, within the Godhead are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They all have the same nature, therefore they equal one God. It's a lot like water. You can have it in fog, you can have it in ice, and you break it down, it's still water. You can call it a lot of names. So when you, you get down to God, all three persons have the same uh, attributes, the same characteristics, they have the same nature, and so they equal God. And we talked about the, the plurality of Elohim and how uh, there were four verses in Scripture, Old Testament Scripture, that talked about let us or we, showing the plurality of Elohim as creator. And I gave you those Scriptures, and someone told me I made a mistake. So I'm going to write that tonight. Uh, the, th the four scriptures in the Old Testament, of course, are Genesis 1.26, Genesis 3.22, Genesis 11.7. Now this is the one I got wrong. She said I accidentally said Revelations. Isaiah 6.8, I got that right. Isaiah 6.8 is where God says, let us, or we. Who shall we send, is the question. And that has to do with his plurality. Now, do you understand that? No. You receive that by faith. And if you want to know it, ask the Lord, and he will begin to give you a revelation of it. But to try to comprehend it and try to logic it out, you're going to go into unbelief. You're going to go into unbelief because it just doesn't make sense according to our understanding. But let me pose this. If you could understand God, he wouldn't be God. If you could understand God, you could control him. But we can't control God. And so we get back to who do you say God. So in the, in the Old Testament, Jesus was the word before he became man. In the New Testament, he's the son of God. And, he, and they have called it the Godhead. There are three scriptures where the Godhead is mentioned. Now we looked at some of this. And of course... Uh, as we looked at what the Apostle Paul was saying in chapter 1, he had three revelations. Now, revela revelation means that something's unveiled in Scripture to you so you can understand it better. It's uncovered. And so we, he's given us three revelations in Romans chapter 1. They're very simple, but it actually finds the springboard in 16 of Romans 1, which says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is simply this. Jesus died for sins. Everyone's a sinner. He died for your sin. He took your place on the cross. And he became your substitute. Now, if you don't accept him as your substitute, if you don't receive 
him as your substitute, then you still stand condemned because you have no place of justification. Only in Christ can you be justified. Now, as we get into this, it goes on to say in 16, uh, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. We talked about believing. It's not just, okay, I agree with that. It is taking it in your heart saying it's truth. It's true. I believe that Jesus died for me in my place because I'm a sinner. I was lost until I received him because of my sin. Anyway, when you uh, believe that, okay, uh, and he goes on to say to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to everyone. Whoever will believe that is embraced in, into eternal life. It doesn't matter who you are. And this is important because in our society we are getting to, uh, well, this person belongs in this group. This per person belongs in that group. He's no respecter of persons. The, the, the distinctions and difference comes because of our own prejudice and biases. That's the only reason. God sees souls. He doesn't see this, that. He sees your soul. And so anyway, that it, the three revelations are off of this reality of the gospel, being the power of God's salvation. So the first one is found in 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Notice the word revealed. It means revelation. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, what it means for it to be revealed from faith to faith is that because of Paul, we're here today. It's because of other people's testimonies of who God is. It's because of their faith we're here today. That righteousness of God, and of course, God has to count something as righteousness, that only happens if you do it by faith. It counts as righteous, but it's revealed from faith to faith. Now, here's the second one. It's found in 18. This is the one that a lot of people don't like. For the wrath of God, oh, I don't like that one, is revealed from heaven. The other one was revealed to. This is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So here you have the hope of salvation through faith. Now you have the opposite reality of salvation if you don't have faith. The wrath of God abides on you today. It's that simple. He has revealed it from heaven as the great judge of all humanity. He will come back and he will judge you on the basis of what you did with the gospel. It's that simple. And the gospel is meant to bring change in your life personally. It's meant to change your attitude, change how you walk, how you handle things, how you approach everything, because the gospel is the truth. It's a transforming reality of who God is and what he wants to do in your life today. And the reality is, is you can walk. You can exercise godliness. You can walk in righteousness. You can learn how to handle the truth in righteousness because of faith and believing in the word of God. Now here comes the third one. And he says all this. The reason the wrath of God is on everybody is because God, people know that God exists. Now they can say, oh no, he doesn't exist. He does exist. There are two records of God that everyone has if they really care to tune in. The first one is creation. The invisible things of creation that holds all creation together shows us that there's an invisible God who created it all. It's all there in creation. DNA, we can go on and on and on about the invisible things of creation. How it is the invisible things we can't see that ensures the world that we see functions. And behind the invisible things is an invisible God who made it all possible. He's our creator. The second record we're going to get in that is your conscience. God instilled in every man a conscience that knows there's a God. Now, I may not understand who God is, but I know there's a God out there. 
And the problem is, as we're going to see in the Godhead, as far as creation, we talked about all three persons being part of creation. That means the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That he's also part of salvation, as we're going to look. But you can refuse to believe that. You can refuse to believe the record of creation and say, oh, there's no God. You can go along with higher uh, criticism and all that is said about evolution. You can go along with that and end up in total unbelief towards God and in the end not retain the knowledge of God. You can sear your conscience against God. And say, oh, well, you know, there's that moral idea that there's things right and wrong. You can sear that because what is morally right that we understand is attached to a moral God. And we have a sense of that. We have a sense that we're going to be judged if we don't get our life right with God. He is there. He's personal. So it shows us in 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. It's saying here, hey, he's showing you that he exists. There's not going to be any excuse. It goes on to say, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. It says it's seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. All creation shows the power of God. All creation. So your third revelation is the Godhead, the power of the Godhead. That he is behind all things. Everything you see is because of what he has done. He has created all. We looked at all of that. And the beauty of it is that if you look at these three revelations, beginning with the gospel, the power of God, you have an incredible picture that emerges that you can go forward and backward with because we begin with the gospel and where do we go we go to the understanding of what true righteousness is how to avoid the wrath of God why because of the power of the Godhead is capable and able of bringing forth salvation now when we start with the power of the Godhead and we go back and say, you know what? It's because of who God is, there's going to be wrath. But look at the hope he has provided man through faith. Why? Because of the power of the gospel. It's a simple picture. And you can go either way with it. And you're going to come to the same point. Either you're going to come to the power of the Godhead, or you're going to come to the power of the gospel, which is able to save you, or are you going to start with the gospel and end with the power of the Godhead who is able to save you? And so there's a powerful picture in this. That's why the gospel, which is Jesus died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again three days later. That's why the gospel is so important because it has all the power of heaven behind it. And the reason it has the power of heaven behind it is because he doesn't want you to perish. He doesn't want you to stand under his wrath. So all the powers behind this incredible message that we have, as Christians, I hate to say it, take for granted. We've heard it so much, maybe. Oh, I've heard that. I don't care if you heard it. Do you believe it? Is it in your heart? Is it something that is so, so with you? That there's no doubt in you. Hey, he died for me. He made it possible for me to have a new life. He makes it possible for me to live for, with him for eternity. That's a real key. And so uh, that's why Paul, in Galatians chapter 1, if you just keep your hands in Romans there, and Galatians is just over there, a couple of books. Well, actually, yeah, Pascal. Corinthians he says something of very important and this is why I get really concerned with people because of what he says we're going to begin in verse 9 of chapter 1 it says I marvel that you are so soon removed from him he's talking about Christ that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel that's a 
Galatians 1, 6. I marvel, yeah, 1, 6. Did I say 1, 9? I'm going to go read to 1, 9. Okay. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. He says there's people trying to pervert it. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. This is very tough language. He was not kidding here. And he says it the second time. And, he, and as we said before, so shall I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that he have received, let him be a curse. It's easy to change the gospel. It's easy to water it down. It's easy to take sin out. Oh, it's not so bad. Sin's not so bad. That's why Christ came. The bad news is we're doomed. The good news is that Jesus dealt with it. Amen. He came to deal with it. That's the good news. That's why we call the gospel the good news. It's man is lost, but God has provided a solution through Christ. So we get into this a little bit more. This message has all heaven and divine power backing it up. It presents the problem of man's sin and lost state and in light of the solution, leaving man with hope. Do you have hope today? Now we're told that man can know there's a God because of creation, uh, but if he refuses the record of creation, then he does have that conscience part. But if he refuses that, then his conscience will be seared. And there's no point of conviction. It's a very dangerous place to be when you keep ignoring and pushing back the gospel. Now, man can decide if he wants to know God or not. I'm going to, I'm going to put it there to you, okay? I always had this awareness there was a God. I didn't know him, but I had an awareness there was a God. And I had a certain attraction to God, but there was no conviction there. I knew of God, but I didn't know who he really was. That was my problem. I had a vague notion of God, a sentimental notion, and that's the problem with man. He either intellectually approaches God, or he has a sentimental idea about God. God is neither a notion or a sentiment. He is real, and he's powerful, and one day we're all going to have to answer to him. I can put, choose to allow myself to begin to ask questions. You know, one of the problems is we don't ask questions. We don't ask questions. If you don't ask, your, ask, ask yourself a question, you're not going to think about anything. And I began to say, what's wrong with me? Is there any hope for me? And then I began to hear about God. And I'd say, well, I know there's a God. Yeah, but you don't know him. You don't know why he's the solution. You don't even know what the problem is. You just know you're bad, if you're being honest. But you don't know what the problem You know, you really don't understand it all. I'm going to get into why. And eventually, I asked enough questions that one day a light came on and there was the answer Jesus Christ they died for me now that's all I knew I since I've learned a lot about Jesus Christ but at that point the one thing I knew is yes I was a sinner but Jesus took care of it Jesus took care of that for me Are you asking questions? Are you curious? Are you concerned that maybe there's an eternity that you might have to answer for your life here? We have to sometimes ask ourselves questions. Now, we are told that in the end there's not going to be an excuse. Oh, God, I didn't know about you, really. You chose not to know me. You chose to go your own way. I put it out there. I put it in you. So you would know there's a God. 
that you had a creator. Now let me ask you something. How many of you have bought a car? Oh, that's the best looking car, right? What did you get that car for? Well, to travel. What if you got in there and you went to start it and it didn't go? What kind, how precious would that car be to you at that time? You would say, this car is a lemon. Well, guess what? That car was created so you could drive it. You were created for a reason too. And if you don't, if you don't find that reason, you're never going to be satisfied. Because you have a purpose. God had a purpose when he created you and I. And we're going to get down to that today. Tonight, I should say. There is a problem. We have these two records, one of creation, one of conscience. There's a problem because man is spiritually blind towards the light of the gospel. That's the problem. Man is spiritually blind okay that's why you you can't know God in this state you're blind to God you're blind to the light someone gave the a good illustration they said there was this uh, uh, big meeting going on and there was this big preaching going on and there was this guy sitting there and he was listening to the preaching and all of a sudden, the lights went off, and everybody's having chaos and all this stuff. And he's saying, what's wrong? What's wrong? He was blind. He didn't know the lights were off. And when the lights came on, he didn't know that either. See, that's the problem with man. He's spiritually blind if he hasn't received Christ. He thinks this is light because all he sees is darkness. And so when the light comes on, he still doesn't realize that he's blind. To get man to realize he's spiritually blind takes an act of God. Because we think we're so smart. Okay? And so it talks about man being blind. He is blind towards the light of the gospel. Who is the light of the gospel? Now, 2 Corinthians 4, 2, 5 talks about if the gospel be hidden... This message is hidden to those who are lost. Amen. And then it goes on to say this in verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 4. For God commandeth the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the light. So here comes Christ. I can't see him. I don't have any traction. I don't know which way to go because I am spiritually blind. And I didn't realize I was so spiritually blind because I had religion. I had all kinds of things, but I was spiritually blind. But the light began to start dawning. And in the center of that light was Jesus himself. I had to see Jesus. I had to see what he did for me on the cross. I had to see what he wanted to be to me. Not something I tacked on, but something that was always a part of my life in every way. Jesus is the light of the gospel. He is the light of the world, Amen. as confirmed by John 8, 12, 9, 5. And John 1, 4 explains that the light of Christ is the life of man. If you have the light of Christ, you have the life of God in you. You have eternal life. And that is what lights your path. Is his life in you. It helps you to know what you need to do. At first it's confusing. At first you know you're like a little baby. You don't know much. But if you decide. To really get real with Christ. You'll grow up. You'll grow up in Christ. You'll grow up in the knowledge of Christ. You'll grow up in that light. And you'll walk in that light. And things will begin to make sense to you that never made sense before. But you have to be willing to grow up. Let's face it. We don't like to grow up. It can be rough. It can be tough. But we need to grow up. Now listen to what... Uh, John said in John 1.5, he says, And the light shines in darkness. In other words, Christ shines in the darkness, 
but the darkness comprehends it not. In other words, even though I encounter Christ, I can't comprehend him. I can't comprehend him. He's still maybe vague. Maybe if I do see him, it's sort of in this long light or premise. I really don't have a clear understanding. I mean, we go and we celebrate Easter. Why do you celebrate Easter? Oh, well, that's what we've always done. It's a religious holiday, right? Why do you celebrate Easter? How many of us celebrate Christmas? Oh, why do you celebrate Christmas? Well, you know, Jesus, Jesus came into the world. What was the significance of Jesus coming into the world? God came in the flesh so he could die for you. That's the significance. And Easter's all about him dying for you. Easter is about him, you know, taking your place on the cross, being your substitute. Now, you can have light, but if man is blind, he can't see the light. He can't comprehend it. He doesn't even know it's there. Christ is there. He may be calling you. He may be uh, trying to get your attention. He's there, but you can't see him. You can't hear him. Because you're dull of hearing. So, that's a problem that we have. Now, here man was created to walk with God. I want you to know you were created to walk with God. Go back to when God put man, Adam, in the garden. It was all about walking with Adam. It was all about having this relationship, full, complete, in the garden. That's what it was about. So he put man in there to walk with man, to have a relationship with man, to interact with man. But guess what? Adam blew it in sin. And from then on, the reality of God became dimmer and dimmer and dimmer to man. Now, you look at the very beginning and you read Genesis and what you will know is that everybody before the flood knew there was a God. Everybody. You have Enoch and Moses. I mean Noah, sorry. <laughs> Enoch and Noah who walked with God. You have, you have the people building a tower in defiance of God. Those people knew there was a God because of the conscience, because of the reality of it. Now, here's the other key. Other people knew there was a God. Cicero noted that nature, that nature has imprinted on the minds of all the idea of God. He admitted that. Other great people that we have read and philosophers know that there was a God. So what happened with man? What happened with man? Well, we call it a higher criticism. We call it evolution. We call it all kinds of things. That says, you know what? Man's in control of his own destiny. Man is his own God. Call it new age. Call it whatever you want. Man can create his own garden. Well, how does that work for you? We can go on and on. The problem is, it's in this spiritual darkness. And you have to realize that God created you for two reasons. We're going to get into those reasons. One was he wanted to walk with you in a relationship. But the reason he wanted to walk with you is so that he could be glorified in your life. Glorified. And the other reason is worship. He created you and I to worship him. Today, a lot of people worship creation, not the creator. They worship intelligence. They worship money. They worship power. But they don't worship our great creator. So the further man gets away from who God is, the further he gets away from there's, there's a God, the more in darkness he goes, the more he gropes about the issues of life. Now, we often ignore that. Okay, why am I here? Well, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to have fun. Why are you here? You know? Why are you here? You know, this is just passing through in light of eternity. That's why you're here. You're passing through in light of eternity. The world is a big classroom, and life is a tough teacher. 
And it's going to show you you're not in control, you're not God, and you need God if you're being honest with life. That's what it teaches you. Because you know what? The world is tough. It's a sorrowful place. It's a place of loss. It's a place of despair. It's, it's just a tough place. If this is all there is, it's a terrible joke on all humanity. And sadly, that's how people act. It's all it is. I can, it's a terrible joke, so I can live any way I want. So, man is in darkness, he's groping, uh, and this darkness has become light to him. That's the problem. The darkness has become light to man. Uh, he has a false illusion of everything, especially God and life. So why can't we just see the Creator? Paul answers that question. It's in verse 21. Let's look at what he says. He says two things. Because, notice, he says there's not going to be an excuse because that when they knew God, notice he said they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, Neither were, now this is a big one, thankful. Neither were thankful. Okay. But became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. That's two reasons that man goes into darkness. He refuses even though he knows there's a God, he refuses to glorify him. And the second reason is he's unthankful. Now we're going to get down to that. And of course, when you're unthankful, you leave a vacuum. If you don't believe there's a God, you leave a vacuum in your imaginations. And oftentimes what you imagine, what you come up with is vain and it's foolish. Your heart becomes foolish with this uh, darkness. So let's look at this for a minute. What you have to realize, number one, is that God deserves worship. Worship is the way we glorify God, through worship. Worship is a means of service. It's a means of praising Him. It's a means of recognizing Him. But worship is part of and one way of glorifying God. I want you to know it's within man's conscience, I think his DNA, to worship. They have to worship something. They have to have some kind of hope. They have to have some kind of purpose outside themselves. How many of you have worked for certain things, you get it and all of a sudden it's just... There's Why no... There's that? no... <laughs> satisfaction there and you say is this all it is so you go and find something else and then eventually it's like is this all there is and you get enough of it you get so much of it and you say is this what it is is this what it is man searching for something that's satisfying and lasting and everything in this world is not going to satisfy you in the long run it's, it's not going to last in the long run it's all temporary. And so it's within man to worship something. It's within man to honor something bigger than himself, to give himself some kind of hope. Now the tragedy is that the first man, Adam, of course, lost this relationship with God. For everyone, for you and me, he lost that relationship. And, and now we are striving to get that relationship back. I remember... One man was talking to me one time. I was, we were out on the beach. And you, it's amazing the people you meet. And I was just sitting there. This guy was sitting there. And he was, you could tell he was sort of depressed. I said, well, what's going on? You know, we got to talking. He said, you know what? I worked so hard to get my Garden of Eden. I worked so hard. He said, I had marriage, I had children, I had a house, I had everything the American dream allotted me. 
He said, but you know what? I lost it. I lost it. And he said, you know, when I was in there, I wasn't happy. There was all kinds of conflicts going on, all kinds of demands on my life. But he said, I lost it. You see, man is seeking for paradise, but you can't have it without God. There is no Garden of Eden without God. There's nothing there. And this guy lost it all before he realized, you know what, what, what was I working for? To lose it all? What was I working for? My wife? And she left me? It didn't make sense to him. He was one discouraged individual. But you know what was sad? He wasn't open to hear about God either. God was what he was looking for in the end. And God will create that paradise in fellowship with him. Now the Bible tells us that we worship God in spirit truth. So what you have to know is there's no inclination to worship God unless the Spirit's there. If the Holy Spirit's not there, there's no inclination to worship Him. And then if you don't believe He is who He is, then there's no truth to worship Him. How do you worship someone you don't know? You've got to know Him to worship Him. And the more you know him, the greater your worship will be. Please hear me. The more you know him, the greater your worship, whether it's in service or praise and worship, whatever, is going to be. Because you cannot worship someone you don't really know. That's the bottom line. And so the more you get to know God through Jesus Christ, the more you will begin to worship him the more you will develop that inclination to turn to him and to seek him out instead of seeking the things out in the world to make you happy, to give you purpose. Now, because the spirit's not there, because the truth's not there, it creates a dark state in the soul of man. And it's at this point, man is nothing more than a religious animal. That's what it says. He is wandering based in his understanding of God and life and usually pagan in practices. So outside of God and life, okay, outside of worshiping the true God, there is nothing but paganism, superstition, and fleshly worship of idols. There's nothing but speculation and skepticism and always trying to figure it out because nothing makes sense. Now, granted, we may not always be in this state. Sometimes we think we're on top of the world. How long does that last? Sometimes we think we got the tiger by the tail. How long do you keep that tiger by the tail before it bites you? So I'll try it outside of worship, the true God. There's nothing but paganism, superstition. And this is what we see. Now, man will worship something. And remember this, please. Satan is after your worship. If you are worshiping anything but God, you're worshiping Satan. It's all going back to him. Somehow, the honor, the recognition, it's all going back to him. Look at this temptation of Jesus, Matthew 4.10. It says, here Satan comes and he offers him. He says, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. Well, Satan all, owned all the kingdoms of the world, okay? He says, I'll give them to you. And this was Jesus' answer. He says, get thee hence, Satan, for it's written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I'm not going to worship you. You see, every time you bow down to some Satan's system to, uh, to have something or to sell your soul, you're worshiping Satan. And Jesus knew that. Where's your heart? It comes down to your heart. Now man's unwillingness to worship God has caused man to fall into greater spiritual darkness where he can't see what is true or real. The second aspect that caused man to lose spiritual insight about God's existence is unthankfulness. This is a real problem today. 
We're spoiled rotten. We have such abundance. We have no idea what it means to go without sometimes because we have our credit cards, we have this. If I want something bad enough, I just go out and get it. Do we really need it all? I don't know about you, sometimes all the stuff I have is one big fat burden. You know, because it comes responsibilities. And I don't want that to take my attention off of what's important because sometimes we can lose what's important. The problem with man is he refuses to see that his life and all, okay, that he, he has comes from God. Everything you have comes from God. If he didn't bless it, touch it, you wouldn't have it. You won't. And I'm going to give you an example of that. It's all because God. And are we thankful for it? Now, there's, there's this idea that, you know, we earn it or we deserve it. But I want you to know everything comes from God. James 1.17 says, Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow will turn in. In other words, he never changes, is what it's saying. So when we think we deserve something, we end up becoming critical and judgmental. Have you ever seen that about somebody who thinks, oh, I, earned, I deserve this? And then the most critical and judgmental people, they will see what they don't have rather than what they do have. They are totally in grace. They're un, they have no gratitude whatsoever. And then there's those, those, those dear souls. I think, well, we've earned everything. We see no need to be thankful. I earned it. I, after all, I should be able to do as I want with it because I earned it. Let me give you an example. If it wasn't for your environment, you would not have the luxury to earn it. Let me tell you why. Put you in communism countries and see put you there and see what your best talents will get you. It is the grace of God that we have anything. We, we may work hard for things. The Bible says, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat. But we better understand everything we have comes from God. It's a matter of his grace. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's God. And we walk around thinking, oh, well, you know, I've done this. Yeah? Have you thanked God? You know why this country's in trouble? It's for God who is the provider of all the abundance we have. And I fear for these young people because they don't know what they have. They're going to have to lose it. It's going to be too late then. It is God. All good things come from God. And we should be thankful. Now, when we think we deserve something, we're never satisfied. Have you ever noticed that? When people think they deserve something, they want more. They're never satisfied. Look at the fruitcakes in colleges. They've had it all. They're not satisfied. They're not satisfied. Okay? Now, if you think that you've earned something, then you see that, hey, I've earned this, so therefore it's for my pleasure, and I don't really need to share anything. I don't need to, because I've earned it. That's how people look at things. Now, I want, you, I want to tell you something, and it's just what I've learned. God blesses us, so guess what? We can share, give, and be an extension of his goodness and grace to others. That's why he's entrusted us with so much. And so we can be those open vessels and extension to others. Now, he did that for Israel. Israel never got it. He took it all away from Israel. You have to realize that all belongs to him. And what we enjoy today is on loan and it's temporary. 
Now, the test for every believer is something called faithful stewardship. If you're a believer, that's your test. You've got to be faithful with what God has given you. I'm not talking about giving 10% to the rich guys. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about more than that. If it doesn't come from your heart and God doesn't ordain it, don't do it. It's not, he's not going to bless it. Bottom line. God's not after your money. He doesn't need your money. And when churches want your money, guess what? They're not representing the God of heaven. God's after your hearts and your souls. That's what he's after. He doesn't care about what you have. He, he owns everything. Why would he care about what you have? He cares about who you are. That's who he is. He cares about whether you know him or not. Now, if you have truly received salvation and you're growing in the knowledge of his grace, you can't remain unthankful. You cannot. Because there's times you're going to be so overwhelmed with thankfulness when you start thinking about what he's done for you or where he's intervened on your behalf. I mean, we have so many stories of where God has intervened on our behalf in miraculous ways. And we're just sometimes overwhelmed by it. And, and we forget a lot of what he's done for us. You know, and, and sometimes I have to sit there and when I start sharing, I think, oh yeah, I know I remember that. What he's done for us. Everything belongs to him, including you, because he's redeemed you. We're to present our bodies as living sacrifices. Consider this statement. I thought that was interesting. Base in gratitude, the marble hearted thing is what someone called it. The marble hearted thing. In gratitude. Even Shakespeare said this. I was a little surprised. I hate ingratitude more in a man than lying, vainness, babbling, drunkenness, or any taint vice. Now, as someone pointed out, the reason for such conclusion is that ingratitude is one of the parent sins that produce many other sins. It's true. I believe it. It's true. It is the will of God that we be thankful, that we give thanks in all things. That's what 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us. It's the will of God to be thankful. Now, we live in a world in America, we see such ingratitude sometimes because people do not know what they have. And a lot of these people, well, I'm, I'm thinking of this generation that's coming up, millennials, they call them. They're not all that way. Okay, there are some really sharp millennials out there. But the ones we see in college, these overrated, pathetic colleges, okay, that's who I'm talking about. The ones that we see on the streets with their faces covered up because they're a bunch of cowards. I'm talking about those type of people. These type of individuals never had to work for anything. Okay? They never had to work for it, sacrifice for it, or see, and therefore they see no need for it, like freedom. Now, responsibilities to these individuals are unbearable, unnecessary burdens. That's how they look at it. After all, they deserve the good life, right? And it should not cost them anything. That's how they look at it. And it certainly should not be a burden. That makes them uncomfortable. That's how they look at it. I've seen it. I've heard it. We have produced a generation of spoiled ingrates that prefer to be paupers in everything because they assume they deserve everything handed to them. They are spiritually, morally, character-wise bankrupt 100%. And, and the big key is they're not thankful for anything. We see it in our own society. 
They are the poorest of people in the area of characters, morals, initiative, spiritual inclinations. And sadly, and this is a problem for parents who've given their kids everything. Oh, I don't want them to experience what I, you know, my hardships. I'm thankful my parents were poor because I had to work for everything. I, I learned to appreciate everything that way. But what we've done, okay, is that these people that are coming up in this generation that are so unthankful, they in the end are willing to come into bondage to everything and ultimately will sell their souls to anything that will take the great burden away from them of paying the cost. Amen. That's the bottom line. And it's all because they're unthankful. They're unthankful. And guess what? That, that's also freedom. Having gratitude means you put value on something. You've earned it. It's been important for you enough to seek after, pursue it, and pay whatever price you have to to have it. And I want you to know today, to know God will cost you. But I hope you're willing to pay the price to know him. So this brings us back to man's spiritual darkness. Before the light of the world, Jesus came into the midst of humanity, and John the Baptist was sent to wake up men to the fact that the light was coming and would walk among them again. John the Baptist woke people up with fiery preaching that called for them to repent and to flee from God's wrath to come. So what about now? Well, we have the preaching of the gospel. And guess what? That preaching of the gospel has the light of Jesus in it. And when you preach the gospel in power and authority, it's meant to wake up people who are asleep, comatose, and dead. To wake them up to their spiritual plight. To cause them to know the urgency that God's wrath abides on them right now and they need to flee it as never before. The preaching of the gospel. It's to wake up blind men to their spiritual flight, their spiritual condition, so that they can flee that wrath and be saved for eternity. That's why the gospel is so important. It's to wake up people. It's to wake up people to their plight. And when you're not preaching it, the real gospel, you're not preaching it, power and anointing, it's not going to wake anybody up. What it does is it puts everybody to sleep. And today, there's a lot of people asleep in the pews. So as I uh, come to an end, I really want to challenge you today. Don't leave without Christ. If you don't have him today, don't leave without him. Make it right with God. He'll meet you. He will show you who he is. He will save you because that's his heart. That's why he came.